The Bills are entering the suffering from success stage of team building where they've drafted a superstar quarterback, paid him a big extension. Now those $30 million plus cap hits start to really limit your roster flexibility. They lost their top two receivers from last season, their starting center and both starting safeties. They were able to extend Deion Dawkins and Taron Johnson, but didn't have the cap space to make a ton of big signings. But paying your quarterback a lot of money doesn't mean you can't build a good roster around him. It just means you've got to hit on your draft picks and find value in free agency. And I actually think the Bills have drafted pretty well, a lot better than some people might realize. And despite the injuries that have kind of started to pile up recently, there's still a lot of reasons to be optimistic. So in this video, we're going to break down the Bills roster, looking at every player, every position group, and how they compare to the rest of the league. I'll be showing these roster graphics throughout the video. If you're new to this series, I've rated every player in the NFL based on this scale. I normalize all the ratings into scores for each position group and combine them into to offense, defense, and overall scores by this waiting table. And I have the Bills ranked as the ninth best team in the NFL, sixth best offense, and 17th best defense. And we're gonna start with Josh Allen, who I have as the second best quarterback in the NFL. The Bills have kind of hit a lot of singles and doubles in the draft recently. They need some of those players to go from good to great and start to carry some of the load for this team. But Josh Allen is the caliber of quarterback that can legitimately carry you to a deep playoff run. His arm talent, athleticism, poise in the pocket, I really didn't have to think too hard about ranking him as the second best quarterback. In my opinion, the gap between Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen is smaller than the gap between Josh Allen and anybody else. And to get into some of the discourse really quickly, I think the turnover narrative with Josh Allen is one of the most overblown narratives in all of football, and it's incorrect or misguided, I think, on two fronts. First of all, he doesn't have nearly as big of a problem when it comes to negative plays as a lot of people think. Yes, he threw a lot of interceptions last year a handful of those weren't his fault at all you know the ball bounces off his receivers hands on a perfectly accurate pass there's nothing he can do about that and he was exactly league average in turnover worthy play rate so he's getting punished at a much higher rate for his bad decisions than other quarterbacks around the nfl are and he's also being disproportionately harmed by bad luck and receiver error and stuff like that and on the same point the people that give josh allen such a hard time for the turnovers don't give him any credit for avoiding sacks which in terms of EPA is about a half to a third as bad as an interception. He had the lowest pressure to sack rate in the NFL last year at 10%. He consistently avoids bad sacks and can lead a successful passing offense even if he doesn't have the best protection. So that's the first point. He has a negative play problem if you only look at raw interception total. If you look at any other metric or actually watch the games to see the context of these plays, it's not really a major issue. But the second point I want to make is that his bad interceptions are a byproduct of his play style and it's just something that comes along with all of the positive things that he brings your offense. To have a top tier passing game, you need a quarterback that's willing to attack tight windows, push the ball downfield, have the level of aggressiveness that's just going to result in more interceptions. The reason it's a problem when Daniel Jones or Bailey Zappi or Desmond Ritter throw a bunch of interceptions is because they aren't offsetting that with five or six game changing throws every week. In Josh Allen's case, he's maximizing everything that he can get out of this passing game, pushing the ball into tight windows, that's just going to result in more interceptions. Now, if we're comparing him to Patrick Mahomes, like one way Josh Allen could overtake Patrick Mahomes is cut down the turnovers, but comparing him to pretty much everyone else in the NFL, it's a non-issue to me. The running back room is led by James Cook, who's one of several players on this roster that the Bills need to go from good to great. I mentioned it talking about Josh Allen, but the Bills have a lot of solid young players. They need a few of them to emerge as reliable, consistent stars or superstars to help take some of the load off of carrying this team. And James Cook is one of those players that has the potential to outperform where I have him rated. He does all of the difficult, rare things at a high level. He just needs to become more reliable at the kind of afterthought aspects of the running back position. He's athletic. He's extremely elusive in open space. He can make that second or third level defender miss in the open field. He has really good vision and anticipation of windows opening in his peripheral. He can separate from linebackers consistently on options and Texas routes, and he has a lot of the traits to be one of the best third down backs in the league. He just has to get more consistent in a few areas. First of all, he had four fumbles last year. They were actually concentrated into two games. He had two fumbles against the Chargers and against the Broncos. And despite his receiving skills, he had seven drops last year. So he's got to become more reliable, securing and holding onto the football. He also isn't a great pass blocker at this point. So to emerge as that do it all third down back, he's got to become someone they can trust 
plus to protect the quarterback. But they drafted a really exciting backup in the fourth round, Ray Davis out of Kentucky. James Cook, in my opinion, is too good for Davis to take his job, but he should definitely push for snaps and be a part of this offense. He has the contact balance and power as a runner that you would expect for someone of his build, but he also has good change of direction skills and creativity in between the tackles. And he's an excellent receiving back. He can run the full route tree. He can track the ball over his shoulder. You even saw in the preseason, he made a really nice toe tap on the sideline. I think the play was called back for an unrelated penalty, but you can still see the receiving skills. He's a very well-rounded running back, and this should be a quality one-two punch if they decide to lean more on the running game this year. And a reason they might want to lean more on the running game is the questions they have at receiver. I think it's clearly the biggest weakness on the offense and arguably on the entire roster. Khalil Shakir is the one proven known quantity. He had a really promising second year and showed that he can be a dynamic weapon from the slot. He's really good after the catch. He's a shifty route runner. He's got reliable hands, good speed. Most of his production last year did come against zone coverage, so his ability against tight press man is a bit of a question, but I still feel confident in Khalil Shakir. And the second receiver is Curtis Samuel, who's a good player, but I've got to mention he's now week to week with turf toe, which could keep him out for the first couple weeks, but it's also something that could linger throughout the entire season. That isn't really captured in the ratings, but something to keep in mind. As a player though, he's a good balance of a gadget weapon, a route runner from the slot, and a deep threat. He isn't elite or great at one specific skill, but he can give you a little bit of everything. He had Deron Bland on skates in the Thanksgiving game, uh, beat Christian Benford on a go route from the outside. If they can get him healthy, this is a passable top two receivers, but without him, I'm a lot more skeptical. Keon Coleman, I've given the spiel so many times on this channel at this point. I was not a huge fan of him coming out of the draft. Didn't really see the separation ability from an athleticism or a technique standpoint. He hasn't done much in the preseason, but he's had Mitchell Trubisky throwing him the ball. If he can exceed my expectations, that would obviously resolve most of my concerns. There's definitely potential. He's a young player, great ball skills, has that alpha demeanor and play style. But based on my evaluation, that's just not something I would bank on happening. And then MVS has also gotten banged up recently. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the scouting report on him. He can get open down the field, but some of the worst drop issues and ball tracking that you'll see for a starting receiver but his ability as a deep threat is still good enough for teams to keep putting him on the field because it's just a numbers game he's going to get open enough times to offset the fact that he's going to drop half of his open targets mac hollins is kind of a blocking fourth or fifth receiver definitely expect him to make the roster kj hamler has never really panned out or been able to stay healthy and then they've got guys like justin shorter tyrell shavers andy isabella that are fighting for roster spots if there's one position group that the bills end up not being being able to overcome, my bet would be on wide receiver. Keon Coleman will obviously swing this a lot in either direction. Khalil Shakir could also take another jump from year two to year three, but they also need Curtis Samuel and MVS to get healthy. But if we look at it in terms of pass catchers, that makes me a lot more optimistic because Dalton Kincaid is a player that I think has superstar potential and should be this team's number one target. It was overshadowed by Sam Laporta's historic rookie season, but Dalton Kincaid had a really good rookie year in his own right. And especially down the stretch, he started to show that he could win at every level of the field and be a complete receiving tight end. The first three quarters of his rookie year, he was really just an underneath dump off target. He was running mostly six to seven yard option routes. And as a short to intermediate route runner, you saw a lot of what makes him special. There is a lot of Travis Kelsey to his game. He has the ability to manipulate zone coverage defenders, midpoint the soft spot, always keep himself open. I expect he'll continue to be a very quarterback friendly target within five to 12 yards of the line of scrimmage. But towards the end of the year, the Bills really unlocked him as a deep threat, had him run in seams, posts, corners. He has the speed and athleticism to pull away from linebackers. He's a player that can attack all three levels. It just took him a while to be used in that way. So I have big expectations for Dalton Kincaid. I usually try to be conservative when it comes to projecting jumps for young players in my ratings, but Kincaid's a player that I'm sort of calling my shot on. I think he'll be one of the better tight ends in the NFL. And then Dawson Knox is still a really solid second tight end. Obviously, had his production decline with the addition of Kincaid and he's never had the consistent hands to be the number one option but he can still get open he can make some big plays and I was really impressed with his run blocking last year he kept popping on the tape he had a couple of his best performances in the playoffs but really all season I thought he was doing a ton of work in the run game so I have Knox as the fourth best tight end two in the NFL and then they've also got Quentin Morris who's really good as a tight end three hasn't really had much receiving production but he makes plays as a run blocker they can go into 12, 13 personnel and feel really confident in their run game.
game. The offensive line ranks 15th, not a major strength, but good enough to get the job done in my opinion. And the tackles, I'm actually really excited for. The interior is where it gets a bit more questionable. But starting with the tackles, you've got Deion Dawkins at left tackle, who's in that Taylor Decker, Brian O'Neill, Morgan Moses tier of just very good tackles. A step down from the true shutdown guys, because there are still a couple losses in pass pro every game. But over the course of the season, he's consistent, reliable, high quality tackle play. I really like his combination of power and play strength with technical nuance. He's 320. He's got a rock solid anchor. You almost never see him lose to a bull rush, but he's very skilled with his hands. He's got a wide range of techniques, uses the snatch trap pretty frequently, doesn't have the best balance. Some of the quicker pass rushers can give him trouble and some of his losses look worse than they actually are, but really good player. The last person on this offensive line you're going to complain about and a no brainer move by the Bills to extend him this offseason. And then their right tackle Spencer Brown took a huge step forward last year. They took him in the third round in 2021, kind of a project tackle out of Northern Iowa. His first two years were pretty rough. He started most of the games, but was just not a good pass protector. But in his third year, he took a major step forward in both phases, but most importantly in pass protection. It's not perfect, but he's become at least an above average player and there's still a lot of room to grow. He has rare movement skills for a player of his size. That allows him to make some incredible recoveries and pass protection. It's great if you can just win every rep immediately, but in the NFL, you're going to get put in compromising positions and you've got to be able to recover and still at least survive the rep. You look at this play against Micah Parsons, he does lose the rep initially, but he's able to catch him with this inside hand, slide over and at least somewhat protect the B gap. Instead of this being a clean loss, Josh Allen has time to react to the pressure, break the pocket, find James Cook in the end zone. He has the pocket range to protect the corner against speed rushers. He can slide and mirror inside counters. He has a good anchor. The hand usage is still a work in progress, but that's the area where I saw the most improvement from year two to year three. He got a lot better landing his two hand punch inside consistently. He's always had a lot of hand pop and strike power, but the placement was a lot better last year. He really improved his timing and also showed the ability to play with independent hands. But you want to see another step from Spencer Brown in pass protection. He'll still get his inside hand club too often and give up pressure on those inside counters. He'll occasionally throw his outside hand, not bring his feet with him, give up a short corner. And I think balance might always be somewhat of an issue for a 6'8 player, but he has an issue with leaning too far to the outside when he's blocking a speed rush. And you see on this play against Micah Parsons, he can take advantage of that, club the inside shoulder and put him on the ground. And I was really impressed with his run blocking last year. He can drive defenders off the line of scrimmage. He can connect to linebackers at the second level. He's a good reach blocker. I'd love to see the stat for which tackles in the NFL pull most frequently. I bet Spencer Brown would be near the top of that list. He's a good run blocker really in every scheme. So I think that's something that you can definitely hang your hat on as the pass pro continues to improve. The interior spots are a little bit shaky. Left to right, they've got David Edwards, Connor McGovern, and Osiris Torrance. David Edwards started a few years for the Rams. The Bills signed him last offseason and he didn't really play offensive line for them. He had 161 snaps at tight end, 30 spots at any offensive line position. He basically came in as the sixth offensive lineman when they were going to run the ball and he was a pretty good run blocker, but you never saw him in any exposed pass pro situations. So there's not much to evaluate there. I think he could be a solid starter. We just haven't seen him play offensive line in over a year. Connor McGovern is fine. He was the Bills starting left guard last year. He's going to replace Mitch Morse at center. He's a technically sound pass blocker, not an elite athlete, doesn't have great power, but he moves his feet really well. Excellent hand usage. He doesn't give you much in the run game from all of the tape that I watched. His only two real positive plays were against Mozzie Smith and the Chargers defensive line. I think he should be a replacement level starter. The main question is that he only has 100 career snaps at center, so you never know how that transition is going to work out. And then I don't know how Bills fans felt about Osiris Torrance's rookie season, but I was actually pretty underwhelmed from watching his tape. I actually think there's a chance that he ends up being the biggest weakness on the Bills offensive line. I came away very concerned with his hand usage and his ability to slide his feet in pass pro. He lost to cross chops and swipes constantly, doesn't seem to have the foot speed to recover when a pass rusher wins the edge on him and his hand usage doesn't really help that he puts himself in a lot of compromising positions when he two hand punches he's high and wide with his punch so it ends up just being a bear hug when he throws one hand he overextends gets it swiped down and loses leverage and i think torrance and spencer brown collectively need to get a lot better picking up stunts in year two together he does have a really good anchor i don't worry about bull rushes with him at all but 
I just think there are some limitations for a 347 pound guard when it comes to moving his feet in pass pro. The O-line depth is actually better than a lot of teams. Uh, Lael Collins hasn't played in a year. He seems to have kind of fallen off athletically, but I've always liked Ryan Vandemark, even coming out of UConn. He hasn't really played in the regular season, but every single preseason he's flashed. He had a really nice game against Pittsburgh in week two of this year. Really high end athletic traits, always flashes as a run blocker, has some limitations in pass pro, kind of a similar player to Spencer Brown. And then Cedric Van Pran, they got in the fifth round out of Georgia. Very smart, technically sound player, a ton of strike power, but generally pretty accurate with his hands. He also just anecdotally probably led interior offensive linemen in this past class as far as pancakes per game. Has some similar issues to Osiris Torrance when it comes to foot speed and pass pro. I think that's why he fell later in the draft than a lot of people expected. You see that on his tape, but you also see that with the 12th percentile short shuttle. I think he could earn a starting spot eventually, but at this point, he's just solid depth. And then Alec Anderson and Tylen Grable would probably be my next picks if they decided to keep 10 offensive linemen. The defense ranks 17th, and like the offense, there's a lot of solid players that you'd like to see take the next step and emerge as true stars. And one of those players is edge rusher Greg Rousseau, who was the Bills' best edge rusher last season, 62 pressures, seven sacks. He's a great athlete, long arms, pretty good hand usage, which I think has improved over the course of his career. And he's at his best winning with inside counters. He has a really effective inside club and club swim, kind of unrelated, but a lot of people were trying to blame the elbow brace for Broderick Jones losing that rep in the preseason. They must have not watched the playoff game because Greg Rousseau beat him with the exact same move. With his size and length profile, I wish the bull rush was a little bit more consistently effective. He just has a difficult time, I think, at his height to really establish proper leverage. And he's good enough with his hands to win around the edge, but doesn't have great bend. So that aspect of his game is a little bit limited. He's already a pretty good player, but I still think there's another level that he can hit in terms of efficiency. And they're definitely relying on that happening. I have real questions about Von Miller ever becoming a starting caliber pass rusher again. It's part of what I hate about evaluating and rating players is that we watch these elite players for their entire career. And then the minute there's a sense of a drop off, you just kind of have to go with that because you don't usually see a bounce back for 35 year old players. Von Miller came alive at the end of last year with two pressures in the divisional round, but for the entire season, he had an 8.2% pressure rate, 17 pressures, zero sacks, just didn't look like the player he's always been. And given how much they have invested in him, it would be great if he can return to prior form, but I'm just not confident in that happening. AJ Epinesa did take a step forward last year, got a contract extension. I'm optimistic that he could take another jump and be a quality number two pass rusher. He had some wins against pretty good competition, beat Jordan Maialata with a nice swipe move. He beat Orlando Brown with a swipe, got a strip sack against Cam Robinson. These aren't all elite tackles, but a lot of times you'll see players have breakout seasons and then you go and watch their tape and all of their wins came against the worst three tackles in the league. Epinesa was actually winning against quality starters and in Jordan Maialata's case, Pro Bowl level players. And then Dwayne Smoot is really interesting. If you're getting the 2021 or 2022 version, he could be a really good third pass rusher. Last year, he just completely fell off a cliff. I don't know if he was dealing with an injury, but he looked nothing like he did the previous two or three seasons. From 2020 to 2022, so three seasons, he averaged 39 pressures and seven sacks a year. In 2023, he had 14 and one. And you watch his tape, he's just moving at a different speed. So again, I don't know if it was an injury or age regression, but if he can return to form, he's a nice hybrid defensive end interior rusher that could add a lot of value. And I really like what the Bills did on day three of the draft. Uh, they took Javon Solomon out of Troy in the fifth round. I don't expect him to be a contributor in year one, but for the long term, he's got a lot of enticing traits. I love the short, explosive pass rushers with long arms. I think that's the perfect physical archetype to be a good bull rusher. He's under six foot one, which is almost unheard of for an edge rusher, but he's got almost 34 inch arms, huge hands, had a 37 inch vertical. He just needs to fill out his frame as much as possible because even at his level of competition, he wasn't able to unlock a consistent bull rush. He has really good bend, some nice hand moves to win the outside, but again, needs to get stronger so that he can win with his bull rush and hold up in the run game. The interior defensive line is led by Ed Oliver, who once again has developed into a really good player, but you feel like there's another level that he can hit. And last year, he was extremely productive, 72 pressures, 11 sacks, by far the best season of his career. He has not lived up to some people's Aaron Donald comparisons, but 
still elite quickness for a defensive tackle, just unmirrorable in certain matchups with his ability to cross a blocker's face, win the edge. He's gotten a lot better with his hands and developed a full move set so that he can win with more than just pure quickness. He can club, swipe, cross chop, spin. Still not much of a power rusher, but when it comes to the finesse game, one of the better defensive tackles in the league. But his breakout year ended with his worst game of the season in the divisional round against Kansas City. Trey Smith and Joe Tooney completely blanked him. He didn't have a single pressure and it wasn't just a scheme thing. It wasn't him getting a bunch of double teams. He was just not winning one-on-one. -on -one. You don't want to draw major conclusions from one performance, but for a team that like their entire goal is getting over the hump of beating the Chiefs in the playoffs, you're going to go up against a team that has elite interior offensive linemen, and it's hard to feel too confident in Ed Oliver being able to win against those guys after that performance. But overall, he's still a very good pass rushing defensive tackle and arguably the Bills' best defensive player. And then what Daquan Jones did last year in a small sample size was one of the more surprising performances across the entire NFL. Dating back to his time in Tennessee, he's always just been kind of a steady, reliable, run-stopping nose tackle. Can get you two or three pursuit sacks every year, but not a dynamic pass rusher by any means. You watch him last year though, he was a true force rushing the passer, and you can tell there's been a lot of personal development, but he's also in a scheme that I think unlocks that skill set more than ever. He looked so quick and explosive, violent with his hands, was able to win with power. The Dolphins game, he had multiple quick wins with a club swim. It's unfortunate that his season was cut short because of injury, but last year alone, he was a lot better than a 79 rating. And if he can come back at full strength, I think Ed Oliver and Daquan Jones is a really dynamic interior duo. And his emergence as a pass rusher hasn't come at the expense of his run defense either. They signed Austin Johnson, who's kind of what Daquan Jones was early in his career, just a high floor, low ceiling, run defending nose tackle. Not gonna give you much more than 10 pressures in a sack, but he'll hold his point in the A gap. He can shoot gaps and make some plays in the backfield. And then Dwayne Carter was their third round pick. He was a pretty difficult evaluation because his 2022 tape was really impressive. He looked like he could be a top 50 player, but in 2023, he looked nothing like what he had shown in the previous season. So those evaluations are always difficult. It's kind of a coin flip about whether their penultimate year was the real them or if it was just a flash in the pan. Definitely see the appeal with Dwayne Carter, especially when you consider the leadership qualities and the intangible elements, even though I had a lower grade on him than where they took him. And linebacker took a major hit this week with Matt Milano tearing his pec. The Bills just seem cursed with at least one veteran injury on defense every offseason. That really hurts this defense and moves them down significantly in the rankings. They are set at one linebacker spot. Terrell Bernard in his second year emerged as a very good player. He isn't the biggest linebacker, so there are times that he'll get pancaked at the second level if blockers are able to make contact, but he reads the game quickly, stays ahead of block development. He isn't afraid of contact so there are times that he can power through blocks and in general he does a good job of using his quickness to his advantage to avoid and evade blocks and you'd like to see some more consistency in coverage but he makes a lot of plays in that phase he had a pass breakup against the Bucks that's one of the more impressive plays from a cover linebacker all season he sees the route stem to the outside of him understands that there's probably going to be an inbreaker developing behind him flips his eyes to the quarterback slides into the passing lane fully extends tips the ball up and forces the incompletion they also use him a lot as a pass rusher. He had 20 pressures and eight sacks last year. So the first linebacker spot I have no concerns with, but Dorian Williams is going to be this team's second linebacker, and that's a lot more of an unknown. I really like Dorian Williams coming out of college. He was a third round pick in 2023. They probably wanted to get him another year of development, but he's going to be forced into the lineup most likely. And starting with the good, he has the prototypical frame and athletic profile for a Mike linebacker. Almost 34 inch arms, ran a 4.49 in the 40. He's got the sideline to sideline range to flow with stretch runs. He's also got the length to engage with and play off of blocks. His best reps from last season were just winning pursuit angles to the outside or stacking and chetting at the second level. Early in his rookie year, he had a major problem with missed tackles. His first five games played, he had seven missed tackles, but for the rest of the season, he only had one. So we'll see if that's an issue that he's fixed. And he made some plays in coverage. Really nice job here against the Jags to carry this drag route initially 
initially, but then slide back over, get in front of the sit route and get the pass break up. But from a mental standpoint, you need to see him take a major step forward in that phase. He bites so hard on play action. In his first start, the Giants got him twice with just a heavy play action bootleg, send Darren Waller to the other side on a shallow cross, and he was late to recover, gave up a catch. The Patriots got him with a play action leak route where he left Pharaoh Brown uncovered. And then even in the preseason, in week one, he gave up a big reception on a play action. So tackling and coverage consistency are the two main areas where he needs to show improvement. I really like Dorian Williams in the long term, but for this year, there's a chance that he might be a year away in his development. And then I love the Ula Foscio pick. Haven't heard much from him in the off season. I don't know if he's in play to make an impact. I just thought his size, athleticism, and playmaking instincts would translate to the NFL. And I actually had to add him to the graphic after what he did in week two of the preseason, but Joe Andreessen had a huge performance against the Steelers. He was a UDFA out of Buffalo. I don't even think he was a priority free agent. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he was like a tryout player. I didn't watch his college tape, but he had eight tackles in week two, so could be a player that works his way into the conversation. Regardless of how it all plays out though, I think they're definitely going to miss Matt Milano at linebacker. And then the cornerback room is very solid. I have them ranked seventh in the NFL. Christian Benford was a steal out of Villanova in the sixth round in the 2022 draft. He's emerged as a really good player and over the second half of last year, according to PFF, he was actually the second highest graded corner in coverage. Now, part of that's that he had three forced fumbles, which are great plays, but not necessarily something that's sticky from year to year, but still made some really nice plays in coverage, undercutting the seam route against Miami for the interception. I really like him in off quarters, breaking on deep outs and comebacks. His biggest limitation though is speed. He just will get outrun down the sideline occasionally. That kind of limits how high of a grade I can give him because press man on a go route in a key situation, he's vulnerable to get beat over the top. He does do as good of a job as any corner in the NFL at recovering when he gets beat. When he's a step behind down the sideline, he's really good at reading the receiver's body language, timing his strike on the ball perfectly. He got several pass breakups last year where he was beat initially, but he just had a better recovery. So good player, but still someone that I'd rather have as my cornerback too. And they traded for Rasul Douglas mid-season. That had a major payoff for Four interceptions, four pass breakups with the Bills. Now his four interceptions came against Tim Boyle, Zach Wilson, and Bailey Zappi, so got to put a slight asterisk there. But he still made some plays against the Chiefs, had a nice pass breakup against Cincinnati. Even though they don't have a true number one guy in my opinion, they've got two high-end twos, which I think could be enough. And then one of the best nickels in the league in Taron Johnson, who would be my pick for the Bills' best defensive player. It feels like every good slot corner is underrated, but I still feel like he's one of the more under rated players. Very sticky in coverage, disruptive at the catch point, great run defender. He also had three forced fumbles last season, so hopefully those turnovers can translate from year to year. I think his physicality, the edge that he plays with on top of his coverage skills makes him one of the best DBs in the league. And Kyrie Elam, I still think is worth mentioning as a bit of a wild card. Definitely would be considered a bust as a first round pick, but it's not like he's been awful when he's been on the field. He's had bad moments for sure, only played three games last year, but the Calvin Ridley match up was kind of a disaster. He was getting worked for most of the game, but for whatever reason, he just turns it on in the playoffs. He ran a comeback route for Deontay Johnson, got an interception in the wild card round. His rookie year, he had an interception and a couple pass breakups across their two playoff games. And then last year, he had a couple nice reps against the Giants, still got beat on a slot fade by Darius Slayton. It's hard to say what the verdict on Kyrie Elam is. I don't think he's going to be a number one, but could potentially develop into a contributor at least. And then for the cornerback depth. Uh, Jamarcus Ingram seems like a lock to make the roster. Cam Lewis is in the mix as a backup nickel, but I actually kind of like Daquan Hardy. I thought he was the best of the Penn State corners. Really good athlete. I thought he had a special ability to turn his head and find the ball down the sideline. He gives you value on special teams, and I thought he had a nice game in week two of the preseason, a couple pass breakups. I don't have a major conviction after the top four, but I would probably lean towards Hardy making the roster. And then the biggest defensive weakness is safety where they are in a full transition from Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. Taylor Rapp will probably be one of the starters. He's a decent box safety close to the line of scrimmage, doesn't have a ton of range in single high, most likely a position that they'll look to upgrade next year. You've got the rookie Cole Bishop, who they took at the end of the second round. I thought he was a solid prospect. Still, I think needs a lot of development. He doesn't look that comfortable playing the ball at this point, and he isn't very disciplined in zone coverage, even though he will make some nice instinctive plays over the middle. He's injured right 
right now, so we haven't gotten to see him in the preseason. Even though I'm optimistic for him in the long term, I think it might be a rough start to his NFL career, especially with how mentally taxing this defense is for safeties. And DeMar Hamlin has a chance to be one of the starters, didn't really play at all last year for understandable reasons, but was a replacement level starter in 2022. Mike Edwards is also solid, but again, is injured right now, so we haven't gotten to see him. They at least have options, and there's a chance they land on two guys that can be a solid safety duo. I still think this is one of the worst safety duos in the league, and there's a chance that it really holds this defense back. So as it is right now, it's really just Josh Allen is the one superstar kind of carrying this roster. Not that he's carrying a bad team, he's carrying a bunch of above average to good players, but with James Cook, Dalton Kincaid, Khalil Shakir, there's a lot of weapons that could take a major jump and carry some of that load. And then defensively, you've got Greg Rousseau, AJ Epinesa potentially, um, Ed Oliver, Terrell Bernard. Once again, there's a lot of good starters that could cause this team to exceed expectations if they can take a major step. But I still think this team should make the playoffs. And once you get in, as long as you have Josh Allen, I think you always have a chance. People act like Josh Allen has been bad in the playoffs because they haven't been able to beat the Chiefs. He's actually been one of the best playoff quarterbacks over the last few years. So if they can get some development in certain spots, I still think they have a chance to be a Super Bowl contender.